Good afternoon and welcome to Monday Mug Mentions, week number three. Uh, I'm Marshall from Yonaguana Games and we are chatting about a uh, different uh, mechanism, media, and marketing that I'm interesting, uh, interested in. Hello, Zach. Happy, happy start of the week. Uh, Granite Games Summit was fantastic. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment as well. Actually, uh, my coffee this week uh, is is in a <clears throat> Granite Games Summit custom mug here. So I got this this weekend at Granite Games Summit in New, ha New Hampshire where I had a blast. And I'll get into that in just a second. So um, this week I am drinking uh, Jevalia Cafe's French Roast. And it is delicious. I really, really like it. Uh, it's bitter. Uh, so if you don't like bitter coffee, it's definitely not going to be for you. But it's got a nice bitter, strong taste. Uh, cuts really, really well with some cream and a little bit of uh, sugar. And I'm thrilled. I really, really am happy with this coffee. So I'd recommend it to anybody who's a coffee drinker. Uh, so let's get into the mechanisms uh, that I'm interested in, both a tabletop and a uh, video game this week. Uh, hello, Jonathan. Good to see you. Um, Jonathan has a live uh, project. If you haven't heard, it's this tiny little, tiny little game. I don't think anybody's heard much about it, but I'll, I'll bring some light to it. It's called. Uh, Dinosaur Island, and uh, it's live right now on Kickstarter, if I recall. Uh, you can get the um, expansion for it. You can get the two-player Dulosaur Island, I believe it's called. Please don't let me mess up your pun. And then Dinosaur Island itself, which was very hard to get. Um, for most people I know, it's like impossible to get. You might want to check out their Kickstarter. Uh, it's live right now. From what I recall, it funded like 400% in a few hours. So uh, it just launched this morning and it's super funded. So get in on that. Make sure you get your copy of Dinosaur Island. I think they brought back all the custom meeples and all the awesome stuff you could have gotten on the first campaign. So if you were like missing out, boom, there it is. Uh, it's, it's right back in print. As a matter of fact, I'm probably going to back the whole big, big, big thing uh, just so I can get all the goodies as well. That's uh, I don't back many huge projects, but uh, I've heard so many good things from people I respect their opinions on about Dinosaur Island. You might want to check that out. Thanks for dropping by. I appreciate it, John. And I see uh, another member of Pandasaurus Games is here. So uh, thank you guys for popping in. So mechanisms this week I wanted to talk about. Um, after, after playing this week, and hey, no problem. Thanks, Jonathan. It's a, a very amazing game. I haven't had a chance to play it yet. I've been so busy, but uh, it's on my list of like seriously want to play so it's uh it's it'll it'll get there i'm gonna probably go ahead and uh, pop in on the whole thing though this time i don't want to miss out uh i want to and i the slap bracelet for me i used to wear those in elementary school and people make fun of me uh <laughs> in elementary school for liking them and now i can have a slap bracelet that i can make fun of other people because i have it and they don't so um i would love to have googly eyes on my dino meeples i would that would be fantastic um, so anyway, again, this week, uh, Jevalia Cafe French Roast. I also have my Granite Game Summit mug here. Uh, I got this this week at a Granite Game Summit where we went to play some Record and some amazing games. I got to meet Gil Hova. And uh, before we move into the mechanisms, actually, I'll mention he was kind enough <clears throat> to sign my copy. Let me get the coffee out of the way here. Of Wordsy. And it says, Word up, Marshall, from Gil Hova. And I had an amazing weekend chatting with Gil. Um, one of my new favorite people. I already love listening to him on Lodology, but after meeting him in person, I'm like a super fan right now. He's a he, very pleasant person to chat with. I had a blast talking with him, um, and I look forward to seeing him again at Unpub very soon. So uh, I also wanted to share that since Jeff Engelstein signed my copy of The Expanse at PAX Unplugged, I now have both uh, hosts of Lodology signatures on games. Uh, and actually, I had not yet played Wordsy, and Gil taught me how to play, and I have not yet played The Expanse. So maybe if I can get uh, 
Jeff to teach me the expanse, I'll have a shared awesome experience. But no matter what, I'm really, really th thrilled to have those games signed by them. And yeah, Gil really was uh, very pleasant to chat with. I was, I had such a blast. Gil is the best. I agree, Jonathan. Uh, and slap bracelets are rad. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, I agree. Um, so, and I see Samuel just joined. This is actually Sam from uh, uh, he, Runaway Parade. They have an amazing game called uh, Fire Tower that I got to see again this weekend, and I'm so, so looking forward to it. I believe the Kickstarter is coming. Sam, feel free to tell me when the Kickstarter is coming here in the comment, and I will definitely let everybody know. Um, so, again, you guys, uh, John Gilmore from Panas with Panasaurus Games, and I believe uh, I, I saw uh, – McNair McNair pop in there and uh they are both having a fantastic Monday I gotta say this is like anybody who says don't launch on a Monday doesn't know what they're talking about because look at this campaign it is going through the roof and it's uh I will be part of it as well so uh, in terms of backing it absolutely um all right and Rob Collision you better stick around <clears throat> we're talking about you this week Okay, so let's get into the mechanisms. Uh, I wanted to talk about something that came up this weekend at G2S while I was playing with some different people. Uh, Granite Game Summit in New Hampshire is a blast. If you have not been, you should definitely uh, make the trip, uh, make it part of your annual schedule. I think I will probably always be back. It was super, super fun. So, Rob, I'm glad you're here. Okay, so mechanisms. Um, I'm talking a little bit about dexterity this week. So Meeple Circus by, I believe it's Matagot or Matago. I don't know how to pronounce the uh, publisher's name perfectly, but it's a dexterity game that adds a little bit of Euro to it. So you've got these different objectives where you've got to stack certain types of uh, circus-based meeples on top of other circus-based type meeples. So, um, and again, Sam said that uh, Fire Tower is launching April 24th. You guys make sure you look out for that. So in Meeple Circus, again, it's sort of a weird game where you're <laughs> stacking like uh, you may you might need two tigers, Michael Wright from uh, uh, Unfiltered Gamers here. Hello, Michael. You stack these meeples in Meeple Circus on top of, uh, let's say, you have a board and two tigers and maybe an elephant and a ball, and all of these things got to be stacked in certain ways to get the most points because there's cards that dictate which thing needs to be stacked on top of the other. So I generally am not a huge um, uh, dexterity game fan. I've seen a few recently that I'm very interested in. There's one called, I think, Mars Open, where you flip, you like flick a golf ball thing, and I'm a huge golf fan. I play golf with some of my game friends, and uh, it's, it's, it's a very cool looking idea. Uh, so I'd like to see that one. But Meeple Circus, I played and I had a real blast because you've got these objectives and you're under a time limit and you're kind of just trying to stack everything up while also forming the best possible score in your head that you think you could accomplish in your little circus ring. And you have these different rings of circus, and so sometimes you've got to stretch between two rings on your board of the circus and things like that. So it's a really interesting, fun game I played recently at the Providence Game Guild, and I saw a lot of people enjoying it at Granite Game Summit, and it got me thinking more about dexterity games. Uh, Brad Taylor, good afternoon. Good to see you. Good to see you. Gil Mello, good to see you from Board Game Breakfast. Good to see you, sir. Um, so... After thinking about all these different mechanisms and dexterity, I thought, what's the video game that I play that's the most, I guess, uh, difficult for uh, for me personally in terms of like dexterity? And it's Rocket League, which is uh, uh, a game by uh, Psionics. Uh, it's it's if you've never heard of or seen Rocket League, it's remote controlled, ideally rocket cars uh, that can boost into the sky, playing soccer against one one another. Um, and it's pretty incredible in terms of just the idea. You've got um, a juxtaposition of, uh, you know, two things that don't generally go together. Similar, similar in my mind, you know, to like a Euro game style and a, a dexterity game, which is what Meeple Circus is doing. Uh, good morning, Dan Coacher. Dan is uh, uh, the uh, purveyor of Tectonic Studios, uh, and they make some amazing custom wooden stuff. And as a matter of fact... of Dan's handiwork here real quick. This is one of Dan's painting trays uh, right there. Um, you just get this in flat sheets of wood. You punch it out. You put it together. You put all your paints right in there. They stay, and this sits right on your desk. It is wonderful. Uh, Dan, yeah, what kind of coffee are you drinking? I agree with Zach's question. So I am really impressed with this, and I'm looking forward to more products from Dan. 
Can't wait to see him at PAX East so I can get somewhere to put my stuff. Tectonic Craft Studio. There it's go. There we go. No, 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 no. Perfect. My name, my, our, our game company is called Yanaguana Games, so trust me. I, I, I know all about naming things with difficulty. So, um, but anyway, in Rocket League, you can get better by spending more time doing, you know, difficult hand motions. Um, you're trying to hit a ball into a goal just like soccer, but instead of people, you're using a remote-controlled car. Uh, that jumps up in the air and has all sorts of, you know, cool effects and things like that, which is what makes the game attractive. Um, it's it's got a ranking system that also makes it attractive, so you can get better and gauge your uh, your difficulty or your uh, skill level against other players. Um, now, what's interesting is I didn't think about this until just recently, but one of the few, one of the few ways. <clears throat> or kinds of games that you can go home and actually practice is dexterity games. You could actually take a dexterity game home uh, and say, okay, well, uh, Meeple Circus, I'm going to practice stacking things as quickly as I can uh, in different orientations, and if I get better at that, then I'll be better at Meeple Circus. Similar to Rocket League, you'll get better at it if you practice doing it over and over again. And I don't think for the most part, there's many games that uh, against your opponent, you you can gain advantage by potentially playing it more often other than to know the system that the game is there. But if all the information is laid out and everybody's got a relatively equal skill basis, you can't really practice to get better at some board games. Um, but with a dexterity game, you certainly could. Now, I don't know that you would. I don't know that practicing for Meeple Circus would be fun per se. But it did bring to the mind this... Uh, Mars open golf game uh, where people are flicking something into a box uh, across sort of a table you could practice that that could become be a competitive uh, event uh, speed games um, and I so and that's an interesting uh, an interesting genre speed games where people are doing things like stacking cups you know that is a game um, the cup stacking thing was a craze for quite a while um, and chess that that's an absolute that's an absolute uh, good point there because I would think that you can absolutely practice chess. I would think almost any abstract that's got a two player abstract of that nature you could practice uh, to get better at. Uh, so I, I may have to retract my statement a little bit. That definitely makes sense. But yeah, I was thinking along the lines of like crokinole. You could sit there and practice crokinole at your house. Uh, and get better at it and things like that. Now, now Jonathan brings up an interesting point. Chess, you could absolutely get better at. So could you get better at, uh, let's say, scythe, viticulture? Um, you know, I would think anything that requires a substantial amount of diplomacy would require on your playgroup. Um, but Scythe does have an Atoma that I've played many times. I don't feel like I'm better at playing Scythe against opponents when I play the Atoma, though. I, I feel like it's a different experience to a certain extent. But, it, yeah, that's an interesting point. Chess brings, brings me to think about, now, are you playing the AI or are you playing yourself in chess? I assume you mean you're playing yourself, so you're playing both sides of the board, uh, which brings, brings in that sort of uh, what we do, uh, the play testing before you even bring something to a group of people. So I do this very often um, when I'm testing a game to see if it's even fun. I'll play two or three players worth of, of turns um, for an entire game and you know just say, well, w w what would I do if I was this type of player? I'm an ex-Magic player, so sometimes I'll play as, you know, Timmy as one person, Spike as the next, and, and um, I agree. Jonathan says, I think your delineation of having full open information kind of eliminates a lot of games that are state dependent. And I think that's, that's more probably what I'm touching on is the state dependency of so many board games being uh, that you couldn't necessarily practice uh, those situational um, aspects of most games because they depend on yeah, so many different aspects of, of the state of the game and the type of opponent you have and all those sorts of things. Whereas with a dexterity game, uh, it's who does this one thing the best, uh, or at least this combination of things the best. Uh, so I, I've, I've never designed a dexterity game. I've thought about them. I think they're neat. Um, it's, I've been trying to push myself to make designs that are outside of the things that I generally like to play. Um, I'm going to read something here and take another sip of coffee. Jonathan says the thing about Meeple Circus is that your opponents don't have that much effect on your play at all. And I agree. I think Jonathan is right. That's part of the reason that would be so easy to say, I'm going to practice. Uh, most dexterity games are not going to keep your, uh, keep your opponents 
at odds with you because it would make them overly difficult, I would imagine. But Jonathan uh, brings up your opponent is physics in a dexterity game, which is the universe is AI. I like that. That's a fantastic way of thinking about, about that. Uh, even even simulated physics, like in Rocket League, um, are, are, are your opponent very often. Uh, so... Uh, Gil says the more you play a game, the more you familiarize with the possibilities and recognize strategies, so making you a better player on any game. I think that's somewhat true, um, and I think knowledge of the game as a whole is definitely going to give you a better, I guess the word would be a, a better complete strategy from beginning to end, uh, but I guess I'm assuming in this situation that all the players at the table have a similar... Uh, skill level and a similar understanding of the strategy from beginning to end. We're sort of assuming a uh, an an X player that that shares all these sort of abilities, and I realize that's also not reasonable either, because generally who you're playing with is going to determine how you play very often. So, um, Lindsay says Lindsay Davis uh, from Foam Rain Games, which is a fantastic vendor up here, and they also do enamel pins and some also very very cool stuff. Uh, Lindsay says there's also a difference between being able to recognize the strategy and actually putting it into practice, which is totally true. I can tell you a very good strategy in Food Chain Magnate for doing well, and yet this weekend at Granite Game Summit, I ended up with 92 points, 92 dollars, 92 bucks. I've played the game many times. I've scored hundreds of dollars plenty of times. I was so frustrated with both myself and sort of with the game for being that brutal to me that I, I made you know one or two mistakes and it really, really kept us. So it was interesting, the two newer players in Food Chain Magnate this weekend um, absolutely destroyed the two of us who had played before. Uh, and that, there's something to be said for that game too in that like <clears throat> it doesn't matter how good you are at it. If somebody does something to keep you from operating properly, it, it's, it's debilitating, uh, which is one of my favorite things about the game. It is one of the meanest games ever, but I do enjoy it. Uh, and then Gil says, some of us have no dexterity whatsoever, and I think I'm <sighs> totally understanding of that. I, I am somewhere between none and a tiny little bit. So when we were playing Meeple Circus, I could tell that other people had a better stacking ability by all means, and that I was knocking things over or dropping things on a fairly regular basis. I, uh, I am not a great Meeple Circus player. I did not win the game by any means. Uh, but it's fun. That's what I, I, I found. I was still having fun even when I was poor at it, which um, is not the case in something maybe that's a two-and-a-half-hour strategy game. If you're having a poor time or you know you're playing poorly, that game is sort of dragging on for you, I feel. Um, so uh, Zach says, the game Garbage Day is a very mean dexterity game that I don't think you can practice without trying to beat yourself. Um, and that's something, too, games where you need an opponent to sort of take that I find are hard to test against one another too. I've, I've recently run into that um, while thinking about some different ideas for games and that, you know, I'll, I'll want an opponent to sort of be super mean, but would this person be that mean or Machiavellian in a game? You know, it's sort of a, an interesting thing to, to realize. Uh, so I really, really think that uh, that's the mechanic is like dexterity that I'm interested in maybe working on next that's outside of my comfort zone. Both that and social deduction games are things that I've generally kind of put the like the poo-poo on I've been, I haven't enjoyed. Um, and I think that's doing a disservice to like myself and the game industry is in terms of not even just just completely writing them off. It's possible I explore these ideas and uh, we look at them and we go, yeah, that's not going to be fun. Okay, let's move on back to what we're used to doing, which is more strategy-based or um, fun-based games with theme and stuff. It, it's not to look at things seems really silly, and I think that uh, writing off a, a particular genre of game is not, it's just not, it's, that's not reasonable. You know, that would be silly not to even try. So uh, I would like to try this, uh, and I'm going to unpub in a couple weeks here in the weekend, and I'm going to look at a lot of people who are probably trying things just like that. They're trying new stuff they've never done before, and um, I, I won't have things ready by then in the dexterity. We've already got some other things planned to test there. But um, it, just the idea of thinking, you know, dexterity or different kinds of games that are outside of my particular comfort zone. And dexterity games is definitely one of those mechanisms. And I know some of my other fellow designers and I have been discussed kind of <clears throat> almost, almost sort of like it's a different or laughing or joking at it. Like it's a different sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, I uh, – so – Samuel, I, I, I missed some stuff here. 
Uh, Samuel said, I need my revenge for trying to stymie me with the uh, aerial beer advertisements. I did get eternal marketing. I did have lots of beer advertisements in the air. It did not help me. Uh, I, I failed. And Samuel and uh, Gwen did fantastic. Uh, Rob says, my kids are always mean to me when I play games with them. Uh, well deserved, Rob. Well deserved. Uh, Michael says, awesome stream. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure meeting you at PAX. Well, pleasure meeting you as well, Michael. Uh, and we'll definitely hang out again. I think we definitely will. Uh, uh, hang out again. Uh, and Junk Art, that's another dexterity game by an awesome fella named Sin, uh, who runs a podcast, I believe, called uh, Meeple Syrup. Uh, and I can't wait to meet Sin, hopefully in the near future. We have had some internet chats, and I really, really like what he does as well. Uh, so let's get on to the media that I like, and I'm glad that Rob's here. It's Pawn's Perspective with Rob Kalajian, uh, and he writes amazing articles, articles about games, does reveal videos, unboxing videos, um, but he does them in a way that's honestly not self-aggrandizing uh, or whatever you want to call it. He's very, very, uh, very, very kind about the way that he does his reviews. He's very, very thorough. He's not trying to sell products generally. He's just showing you here's what it is. And I really like that. His articles and his reviews are extremely thorough and they're thoughtful and they come from sort of a place of a gamer that I identify with. And so that's why I really always kind of paid attention to what Rob was doing. Even when I was down south, he was with something called, uh, I believe, a Purple Pawn he was writing. And when I moved up here, I got to meet Rob, and he's a very, very, very cool and nice guy. And I really, really like uh, most of his content is is so well done that, you know, you can read it and you'll sort of have a thought process afterwards. You think about, oh, I didn't think about this game that way, or, oh, that's an interesting way to um, approach that subject. And it, it's just something that I really, really like. So uh, Gil says, Strike is coming out with a new theme. I always make fun of it, but it's actually very entertaining. Um, Lindsay said, a side note, will I see you at Gamma? Unfortunately not. My uh, beautiful wife, Courtney, is uh, seven and a half months pregnant, and I have... Uh, Clearance for one more thing, uh, two more things technically, but one more thing that's far away, which is uh, Unpub in Baltimore. Uh, after that, I will be at PAX East in Baltimore, or sorry, in Boston. Uh, however, I can drive home from that every night and be close enough to the family not to, you know, worry about uh, things. And if baby does come, I can get the call and drive home immediately. So um, no Gamma this year. Next year, Gamma and Origins are very, very possible. Uh, they're, they're very likely, um, almost certainly. We've already talked with everyone there and, and cleared that up, uh, even though I'm missing this year. So uh, Dex games are very group dependent. I definitely agree with that, Gil. Um, if everyone's having fun, you're usually having fun. If people are complaining that you're playing a dexterity game, it's harder to have a good time. That, that tends to be the case with, with most game types, and I think that's often dependent on your game group for sure. Um, uh, Rob, so, uh, and I can't wait to meet you at Unpub as well, Jonathan. I'm really, really looking forward to that. So, Rob, no thanks. Uh, no, 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 like, aw shucks. You're, you're really good at writing uh, quality content that gets to the point of the game as opposed, uh, as opposed to saying, here I am, look at me. Um, oh, and now I'll also talk about games. Um, Rob's also very respectful of the games that he talks about. Even if he doesn't like them, he respects the work that goes into them and things like that. I think some game designers tend to forget that, you know, this is a labor of love. It's very, very, you, you put a lot into a game no matter what you do. If it falls flat on its face, there's a respectful way to say that it's done so. Uh, and there's a disrespectful way to do that, say that it's done so. Uh, and... I think essentially that like like Rob has been able to say like this game doesn't you know suit me or maybe it, it lacks in these areas but usually is able to to speak to some of the different positive things um, that the game has done and uh, and 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 generally that's something I really appreciate too is when just game reviewers are respectful of the industry as a whole and how much work goes into publishing a game and even if something maybe doesn't you know doesn't stand up all around they understand that the, the creator's trying to do something and maybe on the next one they'll do better rob reviewed i don't know if he reviewed or not but he definitely saw my first game shipload of gold at some point it was not a a very good you know full title the the there were many issues with it art wise uh, balance wise and the just overall as a finished product it was not perfect uh, by any means or even close to it <clears throat> but uh, Rob was able to give us a second chance on something like stir fry and look at it and go okay this is you know they've they've learned from their mistakes and things like that 
some reviewers that we've met didn't even look or respond to our emails about stir fry because shipload had been our first foray into gaming so uh it's it's very very nice when you uh meet a reviewer who's also very very kind in person and i've met rob a few times at events up here in the new england area uh, and he's very nice he's very genuine uh, and he's very honest and i think you should always have an honest voice as a reviewer uh and i also know that for a fact he's not in the pocket of any sort of major game distributor or game company or anything like that, which I love being able to support someone who's just doing their own thing, which I know he is as well. So um, that's uh, Rob from Pawn's Perspective, and that's the media that I'm interested in this week, and I follow pretty regularly. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, I'm also a Patreon supporter of Rob's, um, Rob's site. So, um, And then marketing this week... <clears throat> As we finish our cup of coffee, I'm going to talk about uh, Druid City Games and James Hudson. Uh, James currently has a game called Sorcerer City live on Kickstarter. I am a backer. Um, the way that James does marketing is very professional. Uh, the things that James does on Facebook, uh, if you notice like the quality of my video, this is a small, um, uh, you know, uh, webcam. This is a Logitech little webcam. Um, James shoots with some amazing gear. He's got, you know, some amazing gear, amazing production quality. And on top of that, his content's pretty interesting. You know, he's not talking generally about um, nonsense. He's talking about things that, that matter in the industry or that are going on in the industry at the time, um, while also pointing out that they have a product coming. Um, so, uh, and Gil says, uh, coming to Origins, most likely not. The, it, the age of a baby at that time and probably my responsibilities here at the house uh, are going to keep me from Origins. That's not a 100% confirmed right now, but that is almost 100% confirmed right now. Um, it's, it's looking like the summer is going to be mostly taking care of baby and getting everything prepared and made sure that the proofs are correct for record. Uh, Gil also said looking forward to record. Thank you, Gil. Um, and that is the reasons that the reason that I'm not going to be at Origins is I don't think I'll have record ready for that uh, to sell certainly because we won't sell until we've fulfilled all of our backers. That's just something we we do because I I, I hate <laughs> personally seeing people get retail copies of a game I've backed prior to my copy arriving. So we just won't do it. I know others do it, and I know why. It, it's you know you, it's it's we're going to lose money by not taking copies to things like Origins, but I don't I don't care. I want my backers to get their game, and then everyone else gets it afterwards. That's just personally how we uh, how I've always decided we want to do it. If we change in the future, but you know it's so be it. Um, so anyway, uh, what James is doing in terms of also bringing up other people in the industry uh, is the portion of his marketing that I really enjoy. Um, and we're getting sort of close to the end of our time here. I usually, you know, will stick around for a few more questions or to say goodbyes or chat. Um, but, yeah, so uh, James is bringing up other people in the industry. So um, I brought up Dinosaur Island at the beginning of this uh, this chat. Like, James plays Dinosaur Island on video sometimes. He's very, very, very big proponent of how good of a game it is. The reason I am probably backing this is because James told me, first of all, how good Path of Light and Shadow was. And I bought that on his rec recommendation at PAX South. Uh, it's an amazing game. It's become one of my favorites. So then if James says to me that Dinosaur Island's an amazing game with, you know, things that I'd like in it, well, you know, your last recommendation panned out pretty well. So I might as well, you know, listen to this one. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, Brad said Kineticon. Almost certainly. That's one I can drive to and from. And I believe I am uh, helping judge the Connecticut Festival of Indie Games. Uh, this year with with uh, the amazing crew that runs that so um, thank you thank you Gil for for uh, recognizing that that priority is straight uh, it's uh, I also uh, want to keep a, a happy happy marriage and I think that staying here to help out while uh, the baby is probably in sort of that difficult time and mom's recovering and stuff is a good thing to do as well so I appreciate that man thank you for giving me the pass but uh, again just like the last thing about James uh, Dru Druid City as a whole is James does an amazing job of sort of the brand being this whole thing. Uh, however, it's an interesting thing. There's something I wanted to bring up about it where um, somebody the other day said to me that, you know, oh, Grim Forest is, is James's game. Um, and I thought to myself as, as both a publisher and a designer, well, well, that's Tim Eisner's game. And Tim Eisner is a fantastic, you know, developer who's put this game together. So um, I know James put the game together as well. He's the sort of, he run everything, he did everything. He's the publisher as well. They put it together. Um, 
but I would think of it as a Tim Eisner game that, that was published by Druid City, and James Hudson helped f facilitate it all and stuff like that. And it brought this interesting thing to my head of, do people identify a publisher as the creator of a game? Um, I, I know that Stronghold Games gets a lot of, uh, you know, things for like, okay, Terraforming Mars, and Jacob was the designer. Um, it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a mutual relationship. I think that's something to be uh, constantly aware of. Is it's a mutual relationship. More people had eyes on that game because James was working to make sure that people saw it. And more people know who Tim Eisner is because the game was put out by a group that's got a substantial number of followers. Um, so it's an, it's it's important to me that the designer of the game be at the forefront, though, uh, if they want to be. Uh, and maybe that Tim decided, hey, I, I want you to run that show. I just want to make games and do my thing. And I know a ton of designers like that, and I totally respect it, and I love it. Um, but for, for, for my personal perspective, if the designer wants to sort of spotlight and be in the spotlight, I want them to sort of, hey, you know, you, you, this is your game. You show it off. You go do these things. So it was, uh, it was interesting to me just to hear that somebody had had that perspective of the publisher's, it, it's the publisher's game. Um, so uh, I, I agree. Uh, and uh, Jonathan says it's weird about, you know, certain, you know, so um, the credit for Imperial Assault is, of course, for, from Fantasy Flight. Um, they do the work. They do put the, the designer names on the boxes, including Jonathan's, which, um, by the way, I didn't know when we had dinner in San Antonio that, that that was also one of yours. It's sitting right up there on my shelf. Huge fan of that as well. So fantastic game, sir. Um, but the brand of the company is the main driving force, Jonathan says. And I, I, I totally agree with that, I think. Um, it's – if – if Yanaguana Games is thought of as a poor uh, product or a producer of poor products, uh, then any designer who signs a game with us is going to have a harder time selling games, right? But if we're thought of as, as quality products, uh, then it's going to be much easier to sell games. Uh, so, so, yes, you definitely want the actual brand that's, that's supporting your game to do very well. Uh, and I think in that situation where Grim Forest had this symbiotic relationship with, you know, um, uh, being being brought to Druid City, getting an amazing treatment, um, uh, and then Tim Eisner, you know, sort of blowing up. Because, you know, in my, in my opinion, that game blew up. So that's a Tim Eisner game that blew up. Um, I think from there you can sort of see the uh, beneficial relationship that a publisher and a designer can sort of find. And you can see something skyrocket. Uh, right now, I think uh, Jonathan, what he's done with Pandasaurus, uh, with with Dinosaur Island, you're seeing that too. Pandasaurus's first few games are very different from Dinosaur Island. Excuse me. Uh, you know, if you look at their previous games, they're more in line with with uh, traditional Euro games, or you know, the artwork at least is more in line with the things that you'd go, okay, that's a Kickstarter project. Dinosaur Island is like something out of you know. Uh, I, I don't even know how to explain it. It's something like out of, out of Back to the Future meets Jurassic Park meets, uh, you know, Synthwave. Uh, and it's awesome. It looks amazing to me. I, I only missed the first one due to financial stuff. I, I It was too expensive for me, and I, I didn't know enough about it. And now, of course, I'm, I'm all about getting the next one. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Jonathan says everyone talks about games like Rebellion and, and X-Wing. Uh, as as for the company, as opposed to Corey or Jay, and and I agree with that. I've I've met uh, there's a gentleman up here named C Craig Van Ness who was the HeroScape designer, and people do, you know, diehard fans do understand that he made those games. Uh, however, you know, for the most part, people just think HeroScape's a Hasbro product. Uh, so. Um, and then Gil says, when a company puts out a great amount of games, we normally start connecting the games and the publisher. I think Renegade's a big, a good example of that. Uh, it's a fault on us, but I think it'll always happen with some brands, Gil says. Yeah, I, I think it is a fault of the consumer to do that because then you give them a pass on a game that's maybe not great. Um, but at the same time, you know, building your brand is part of building a company. So that's definitely there. And Jonathan says, yes, definitely. I think part of it is all of us growing together, though the art is mostly their vision. Um, that's uh, that's amazing. I mean, the design and the art and all these things come together in this sort of you know nice finished product, and then you have a, a, a great campaign that that's on its second run and doing fantastic. So I'm really that's something to learn from. Um, maybe you know everyone does their piece, and then you have a lot of success that way, as opposed to you know personally, I've I've done 
a, a whole lot of the things that we've done for for our games and and every time we've delegated out and found stuff it's it's been better so i i definitely agree with that um well thank you guys for hanging out again this has been monday mug mentions week three uh i appreciate everybody coming by this has been really really nice um i i hope to see you again next week and uh we will come back and we'll have another cup of coffee and we'll talk about some more stuff. So thanks for checking it out, and I hope to see you guys again soon. Bye-bye.